Hello and welcome to a crash course on Metasploit. Now, Metasploit is a major topic and we could talk for a week on it and you still wouldn't get it all. However, I'm going to try to show you just let's get started with some basics, show you some of the how the commands work, how this whole thing gets set up. And so I'm going to go over this Metasploit cheat sheet along my way. And this is over on tunnelsup.com. So head on over there, look for the cheat sheets, find the Metasploit one. And this is this is your notes, okay? So you don't have to take notes. I've already taken them for you. Just download that, print it out. So we've got a fresh instance of Kali over here. I've, uh, we wanna get started with Metasploit. So what do we do? Well, I wanna use the database in Metasploit. So before I load Metasploit, I wanna load, I wanna make sure the database works. So service, PostgreSQL, start. So make sure that the Postgres database is running and then msfdb init. Make sure that it's been initialized. So this is going to go into the database and create users and tables and all that stuff. It looks like it's already initialized, so I don't need to do anything. So it's time to load Metasploit, MSF console. So what is Metasploit though? Metasploit is a list of, uh, it's, a, it's a framework that has a bunch of known vulnerabilities and like scripts for those vulnerabilities to go and try to execute those scripts on a system that is vulnerable to that vulnerability. And look at this, when it loads, it has 1,585 vulnerabilities and this grows weekly. Um, and so if, if we have a system that's vulnerable to one of these things, we can load it and then execute it and then we're in that system. So we'll show you how that works. Um, but the first thing before you do anything, you're gonna wanna say MSF update. Every week there's a new update in Metasploit and it's best to stay on the latest update. And well, I'm already updated, but if you have to do this update, I recommend exiting out of Metasploit and loading it again because sometimes there's some funky behavior during an up, uh, after an upgrade. Uh, and, and so just reload Metasploit. Okay, so we're all set, we're updated, we've got our database running. What do we do now? Let's take a look at help. So help is going to have all our commands that are available from Metasploit. And we've got all these things. And so you can use this. This is very helpful. I'm going to take a look at DB status, just make sure. And it says we're connected. So if we're going to be using the database, um, you need to make sure DB status says connected. Now the database is entirely optional. You don't have to use it, but I'm going to show you why it's super helpful and super cool. So now we want to exploit something. What do we want to exploit? Well, we got to have a system to exploit, a target, a, a victim. I've got this server on 192.168.56.102. I've downloaded Metasploitable. So this is a, a server that Rapid7 makes that is actually a vulnerable VM that lets you attack it. And it, it's got vulnerabilities that you can practice Metasploit with. So that's there. But uh, take notice, I just did ping from the Metasploit command prompt. And you can do like ifconfig and nmap and all sorts of other things from the command prompt if you want it. You've got a lot of Linux tools here. So keep in mind, you don't have to exit out of Metasploit just to check your IP or route or anything. All right, so from here, we've got this system. We wanna try to exploit it. So we could do an nmap, but I'm gonna do step better. I'm gonna do db nmap. And I'm gonna run a db nmap on this system. Now, what does nmap do? It does a scan a port scan on this system and actually dash ss means it's going to do a tcp scan and then dash a is going to run all sorts of scripts to say what are the versions of these applications what are the versions of the os and all this kind of stuff so hopefully this gives us back a lot of information but this is only going to tell us what ports are open in order to really know a vulnerability exists on a system or at least to have a better um, a better chance of knowing you're gonna to wanna to run a vulnerability scanner and that's gonna be like Nessus or Rapid7. Uh, Rapid7 makes Nexpo's scanner. And so some kind of scanner like that is um, really powerful and it's gonna get into that system and it's gonna try doing default passwords and all kinds of basic passwords and it's gonna try sending some uh, payload data to that host and try to exploit it and that's gonna come back and tell you what vulnerabilities that's you know vulnerable to. And then you can come into Metasploit and use those vulnerabilities. In our case, we're not going to use Nessus, and we're just going to use Nmap and see what we can find. So Nmap results came in. It has a lot of information here. And if you weren't using the database, you'd probably be copying some of this stuff down and putting in a notepad and stuff. But let me show you some cool stuff. Hosts is a command to show us the hosts that are in our database. Services is a command to show us the services that are in our database, and this is super cool. So on this host, and you can see it's all the same host, 
all these ports are open. They're all using TCP. This is their um, service name. They're all open and then any extra information that it was able to get. And now this is really cool. Like we actually have versions of, of applications so now what? Okay, we've got all these, and this is all the data out of the Nmap scan. It just got stuck in the database. And this is gonna be super helpful to simply type services and see this anytime we want. Okay, so we've got all these vulnerability, or not vulnerabilities, these are all just ports that are open. And what could we do about this? Look at this, uh, Unreal IRC chat server seems to be open on 6667. Anyways, so let's start with um, our exploits, right? So we wanna see, uh, what exploits there are we could do show exploit and that's going to show us all the exploits and you saw there was like over a thousand of them and I don't want to show you a list of a thousand but when but when you look at that you're going to see that they're organizing like operating system application and then vulnerability so you might see windows MSSQL um, TCP overload or something and so if you kind of know what you're searching for um, then you can search for that particular string within um, within the, all the exploits. So that's the command search. So what can we search for? Well, let's search for VSFTPD and see if there's anything going on here. And so this is like I was saying. So exploit Unix FTP and then VSFTP daemon backdoor. And this is interesting. It has a description and it says version 2.3.4 command backdoor execution and that's exactly what this system is running 2.3.4 so we've got a pretty solid match let's try this so we'll say use and we'll paste that in so now we've got this here let's say show options and see what options there are for this particular exploit looks like the our host is the only option so we'll set our host 192.168.56.102 and yes, 21 is where the FTP server is running. If it was running on something else, we'd adjust that there. Our targets, oh, we're just going to leave as automatic. And we'll say exploit. Now, if you don't like typing exploit, we can type run. It's the same exact command. There's just an alias for it. OK, so it's attempting found shell. Command shell one, session one opened. Now I'll tell you, if you see this where it says session has been opened, you can jump up and celebrate. Yippee, you've just got shell access to a system. Pop to shell. But wait, what's happening? What's going on here? Not all shells are the same. In this particular case, this shell doesn't give us any sort of prompt, but we can do a command like ls-la and we can see results. So we're in the shell of something. We can say, um, PWD, print working directory, or ID tells me who I am. I'm root, holy cow. So from here I can go into like root SSH and I don't know, get into the authorized keys, add my key to the, my public key to the SSH, the root folder. And then every, and if I try to SSH this, I'll come in as root. So that's gonna be really powerful stuff. So you see that we're in the shell as root. We've already got root access, this is cool. So I'm gonna hit Control Z, and that's gonna send this session to the background. And let me teach you about sessions real quick. So if I type sessions-l, you can see that we have one session. And I can say a session-i, which is interact, one. And that gets us sessions, and that gets us back into where we were. And it even shows us where we were. So this is back in that, um, shell that you got so you can pop in and out of uh, any shell you want in case you want to go back into mesploit and do something else okay so that's great we got into something i could stop there but let me show you some more cool things um when we loaded mesploit i think you saw that it said there was some other other things too so we had this many exploits but we also had this auxiliary stuff what is auxiliary let me show you. Show, oh, we're gonna go back to services, right? And we're gonna see all this stuff. We're gonna have all these things going on. So um, maybe, so auxiliary is all sorts of extra information gathering tools. It's not an exploit. It might be something like a scanner or um, attempting to 
find specific things in the network. So let's see. Um, I want to search for. Oops. I want to search for. I want to see if there's any anon FTP, uh, anonymous FTP logins. So here we go. We've got auxiliary scanner FTP anonymous. So we're going to try this one. We're going to say use auxiliary scanner FTP and show options. And it's going to try this username, anonymous, and this password. So we'll set our hosts. And in this case, we can say um, more than one. We can we can say the whole 24 subnet, you know, if we have a CIDR block, or we can say, let's just do 102, or we can do like another host if we want to. So um, we'll, we'll just set our host to be this one, but I want you to know that, you know, this kind of, uh, the auxiliary stuff can be set to do multiple hosts at once. And so this is really powerful. If you have a whole subnet, you can use an auxiliary scan to say, do this against a whole subnet. Like it, it can pretty much do what Nmap can as well as a lot more stuff. So when we run this, it says it's complete. Um, kind of, it's not sure what's happening, but if we go into the cred, if we type creds, this is gonna tell us in our database what credentials we have or we found and Metasploit found that you know this server has an anonymous login for FTP and so it now you now see that we have uh, successfully done an anonymous connection to the FTP server there so auxiliary scanners and our auxiliary modules are really helpful at giving you an extra piece of information that you may be able to get off uh, get into or use or something that you may not have um, spotted before or it's just you know extra information gathering so don't be afraid to use auxiliary modules all right so let's check out another um another vulnerability see if we can find something else here so we can go down the line and try to do things like uh search for a lot of these things and see which ones are vulnerable or not i'm going to search for postgresql see if there's anything going on in here Oh, so there's a lot of stuff, right? So we've got some auxiliary stuff, and so maybe this is um, this will do a query. See if we can do a query on this Postgres, and maybe we have um, you know a login attempt. So auxiliary can try some of these things, right? We can do all kinds of Postgres auxiliary stuff, but I'm curious what the exploits say. So we're looking at stuff that starts with exploit. Um, well, look at so this was exploit slash Linux. This is exploit slash windows. So since this is a Linux one, let's try this vulnerability. So we'll say use that. And now we'll do show options. And I don't know the database or password or our host. We'll say, oh, I do know our host. So we'll do 192.168.56.102. And that's, well, wait. So it's saying our port is 5432. So let's make sure that's right. So we do services and we see Postgres is running on 5432. So we don't have to change that. Um, the target is fine. If you don't like that, you could do show targets. And you know these are our optional targets, but we'll keep that as the same. But then there's something that's not shown here. And it's not shown because it's just gonna use the default. And that's the payloads. So you saw in our previous exploit, our payload was a shell. We got a shell access to that Linux server. That was our payload. So the payload is something that is executed after we get our vulnerability. So, you know, great, you're vulnerable. Now what do you want to do? And the payload is what you're going to do after that. So if we do, if we show our options in this one to see what payloads we have, there's a lot of options. So first of all, it's going to say all of these are for Linux x86. Um, at the end here, you see there's the shell. So we have, we can do a shell if we want. So if we wanted our payload to be a shell, then here we go, we get a shell. But Metasploit has this really cool thing called Meterpreter. And we're gonna say, we're gonna use Meterpreter bind TCP shell. So it's gonna be, you no, set payload, this Meterpreter bind TCP. Now when we do show options, we should see that payload here. And in fact, it's even asking us for, well, it doesn't ask us for anything else. So we're good to go. 
So we've added this payload and what you'll see is what an interpreter can do. So let's run this and see what happens. All right, so it sends this vulnerable file to it, tried to execute it, and sure enough it did because we see interpreter session two opened. And if I do control Z and exit and do sessions dash L, we now see that there are two sessions, one's a interpreter and one's a Linux shell. So sessions dash I all right, so once again, once we get Meterpreter session open, we celebrate, it's celebration time. You just got a shell or you, you know, got into that server. So what does Meterpreter do? Like there's a command prompt here. What? Well, now we're looking at the bottom of our cheat sheet here at all the different Meterpreter commands. So first, it's this info. This tells us the host name of the system, the uname output, the architecture we're dealing with, it's great. Um, we could do ls and we can do a cat on a file so it's kind of like shell access right and we can even edit that file if we wanted and so now we're in here editing things but um there's also lots of really cool commands that interpreter has it's got all kinds of scripts like for instance you could drop into a python shell or python interpreter and start writing your own python script that you can execute on that system uh, if you're in Windows, you could probably take a, a screenshot of that system or do a, um, you know, whatever the user's seeing or do a, um, a keyboard logger and see whatever the user's typing, you can see what they're doing. So Meterpreter has a lot of really cool commands that you can do. And um, you can even like uh, get a file, right? So if I wanted to download this root CRT it's downloaded now and now if I exit out of interpreter and do LS we can see it's here on my local machine <laughs> so this this makes things like um, you know easier to interact with with that system you know if you want to exfil data out of it then this is a way for you to do it so interpreter has a ton of really cool commands including shell so you could just drop right into a a shell and see what you're doing like where am I and all this stuff if you exit out of the shell you're back to the interpreter prompt um, yeah so my interpreter is really powerful and I could go on and on and on about it so I'm just gonna leave it there as just something that's like it's a really good tool belt for you to use um, again you can do help at the interpreter prompt and you can see all the different things you can look at the the ARP table on that host you can look at the routing table on that host. You can do all kinds of things. IRB is the Ruby shell. Now we're doing, now we can do um, stuff. We can execute things. I don't know Ruby, but you can execute things on that host. It's a Ruby. Uh, you can execute Ruby commands. It's incredible. So Meterpreter has all sorts of really powerful stuff. And um, you can kill processes from here. You can migrate to another process. So maybe you got into a system using a browser exploit, and then you think that person's going to close a browser. So you can migrate to another, uh, you know, process ID or something like that to try to stay in there. So interpreter is super cool and super helpful. And I think that brings us to the end of this crash course on Metasploit. Um, oh, just one last thing. So we're going to go out of here. So you saw that we have our services. We have, we've got our, our database here, right? And we're, what, what we're dealing with here is workspace. This is a workspace, a default workspace. And if I do workspace dash A, I don't know, we have a new workspace. Now when I type workspace, you see two of them. And we're actually in the lab one now. So if I do services, there's, there's nothing here. So a workspace is kind of like a blank slate for working with your database. So you can go back to workspace default and type services and you'll see it all there again. So if you want a fresh new database then just you can either delete the default workspace and it'll create a new one for you or make a new one. Just make a brand new workspace to work on. All right, so I think that's it for just getting your feet dirty and hands dirty with Metasploit. Um, I hope you learned something and thank you for watching.